the first part of this chapter, uh, we introduced the more coolant failure criterion. In part two and part three, uh, we're going to focus on determining the shear strength parameters that are needed in the more coolant failure criterion. And we'll start with the simplest and perhaps the most economic one, the direct shear test. Uh, just a quick review of the more coolant failure criterion. So this more coolant failure criterion basically states that the shear stress at failure, which we call tau f, so that's basically the shear strength of soil, is a function of the normal stress on the failure plane, which we call sigma. And there are two strength parameters, two shear strength parameters involved. One is the cohesion, called C. And the second one is the angle of internal friction, we call phi. The first expression shown on this slide is more coolant failure criterion in terms of total stress. And you can also write this uh, failure criterion in terms of effective stress. That's the first ex a second expression, where C prime and phi prime are the cohesion and friction angle based on the effective stress measure. And phi prime is also called the drain the friction angle. So it's effective and it's also called the drain friction angle. And sigma prime is the effective normal stress on the failure pin. Uh, from the more coolant failure criterion, we can see that the strength parameters that you need to define this more coolant failure criterion function are C and phi, if it's total stress uh, measures, or C prime and phi prime. Okay. So we're going to talk about uh, the using a direct shear test uh, to determine these shear strength parameters. And this slide shows uh, a diagram of the direct shear apparatus. And if you look at this uh, diagram here, so you have your soil specimens. So this soil specimen in the middle of this direct shear box and this soil specimen is sandwiched between two porous stones. So you have porous stone on top and at the bottom here. And then um, the, the soil specimen, this direct shear box is actually um, uh, split in halves. So you have the top and bottom half here. And during the text, uh, during this uh, direct shear test, first you apply a normal stress to the top of the shear box. And you hold this normal force uh, fixed during the test. And then you uh, shear the specimen by moving one half of the box relative to the other. Shown on this diagram, the bottom half of this shear box is moved to the left. And the force apply is measured and also the displacement uh, record is also uh, measured. You can use both uh, force controlled or displacement control to conduct this uh, direct shear test. And uh, from this direct shear test, you can get the normal stress and also the displacement, the vertical displacement. And you can also get the shear force and the shear displacement. So we're going to call this delta S here. And from the normal force and shear force, you can calculate the normal stress and shear stress, which is basically force divided by the cross-sectional area of the specimen. So you have normal stress, we call sigma, and shear stress tau here. And the direct shear results are typically expressed in terms of uh, stress uh, strength or stress displacement, as shown on this slide here. So the top right figure is a plot of shear stress versus shear displacement. You can also plot this in terms of shear stress versus shear strain. So depending on the density, the relative density of the specimen, uh, you, you will get different type of the stress strain or stress displacement behavior. First, let's focus on loose sand. So for loose sand, if you look at this uh, solid line curve, so this is loose sand. So the shear stress increases with shear displacement. 
up to a maximum of what we call uh, tau f here. So as you load the loose sand, as you shear this loose sand in direct shear test, the shear stress basic going is going to momentarily increasing, uh, increase with the shear displacement. And this uh, tau f is the uh, the maximum shear uh, stress. And for dense sand, so that's the dashed line. If you increase, if you shear the specimen, the shear stress is going to increase first. So it's going to increase up to a peak value. And the shear stress that corresponds to this peak value is we call peak shear strength in tau f. And after this peak point, if you continue to shear the specimen, uh, the shear stress actually is going to decrease into what we call ultimate shear strength, tau ultimate. So this tau ultimate is approximately uh, the same as tau f of the loose specimen. So this is the ultimate shear strength. And in terms of uh, height, change height of changing height of the specimen, um, the loose and dense sand specimens also behave uh, very differently. If you look at this uh, bottom figure here, for loose sand, if you shear the specimen, the changing height of the specimen uh, is going in the compression, compressive direction. So basically the sample is to be going to be compressed. And this means that the volume of the sample decreases as you shear the specimen for loose sand. For dense sand, however, so this is the, the dense sand is the dashed line curve. Initially, you have this compressive behavior. So basically you have a negative uh, change in height, meaning the specimen is, uh, is compressed. But as you shear the specimen of a loose sand, it's going to expand. And this behavior is called the dilation. So this positive value, this expansion means as you shear a dense sand specimen, the saccharin is going to increase in height. So the, the volume of the specimen actually increases. So this is a stress versus strain or displacement and this expansion compression versus shear displacement behavior for loose and dense sand. And the other piece of information you can get from direct shear test is volume uh, void ratio change. Because you know the change in height of the specimen, and you know the volume of the specimen, you can actually plot, calculate the void ratio change as the specimen, uh, specimen is displaced. So again, depending on the relative density, if it's a loose sand, the void ratio is going to uh, monotonically decrease as you shear the specimen until it reaches a certain value here that corresponds to the ultimate strength. For a thin sand, as you shear the specimen, the void ratio actually increases. So this corresponds to the expansion or dilation of thin sand specimen. And interestingly, this thin sand, if you shear it, if you apply a sufficiently high shear displacement, the final void ratio is actually going to the same value as that of the loose sand, if you shear it uh, sufficiently large. And this void ratio at sufficiently large displacement level, this is called the critical void ratio. So critical void ratio. So this is a void ratio versus shearing displacement type of uh, behavior for loose end and sand. And uh, as, uh, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, what you want to get from the direct shear test are the these two strength parameters, C and phi, or C prime and phi prime. So if your specimen is uh, dry sandy soil, if it's a dry sand, the total stress and the effective stress is the same because the pore pressure is going to be zero for dry specimen. So you have sigma equals to sigma prime. And for also for dry sand, it's a cohesionless material. So the C prime value is zero. And to get the friction angle, so you basically you only need to determine 
the friction angle phi prime from uh, for dry sand. To get this friction angle, uh, we're going to plot uh, the shear stress at failure versus the corresponding normal stress uh, on this uh, plot here, on this graph here. So let's focus on this solid line first. So this solid line, you see a number of data points. So each of these uh, data points corresponds to a pair of tau f and a sigma prime value. So each of these uh, data points basically is a result of a direct shear test uh, performed on one soil specimen. So you pick, so you, you, you put one soil specimen in the direct shear box and shear it to failure and take the peak value. So this is basically based on the peak shear strength. And that's what we defined as tau f. So this is based on tau f. So for one specimen, you shear it to failure, you get one pair of tau f, and you record the corresponding normal stress you apply. And then you load and you put another similar specimen, put a different uh, effective normal stress on top, and you shear that specimen to failure, you get another data point. So that's how you get these uh, five data points here. And then you fit a straight line through these data points. So, and that straight line is going to pass the origin because for dry sand, the cohesion is zero. And the slope of this line is, so this line basically is your more coolant failure envelope. So this is more coolant failure envelope envelope and the slope of this envelope by definition is the internal angle of friction and for dry sand this is your effective or drained friction angle for more coolant failure envelope the function is tau f equals to because c prime is zero so it's going to be sigma prime times tangent of phi prime and that's how you solve for the drained or effective stress friction angle phi prime. And so that's the peak, that's a solid uh, line that's more coolant failure envelope based on peak shear strength. And similarly, you can actually take the ultimate shear strength. So this is based on tau ultimate. So if I go back a couple of slides. So if you use tau ultimate to plot the failure envelope, that's this dashed line here, and repeat the same process. So for each normal stress value, you have one tau ultimate, and then you repeat this in, on similar samples at a different normal stress, and you get this uh, dashed line. And the, uh, and the, the, the angle of that dashed line is another measure of friction angle that corresponds to the ultimate shear strength. So we call phi prime ultimate. And from this graph, you can tell uh, phi prime is actually larger than the phi prime ultimate. And this is reasonable if you go back again to see uh, this curve. For dense sand, the peak strength tau f, so right here is, so this is peak strength tau f, and this is larger than the ultimate strength uh, tau ultimate here. And this slide shows um, the some TKO values, um, the, the range of friction angles of granular soils. Um, on the vertical axis, that's your friction angle phi prime. Horizontal axis is dry unit weight. And then you have different types of soils. These symbols are USCS soil classification symbols. And also you have these relative density lines. So a couple of res uh, observations here. So first, if you look at these relative density lines, so D are these dashed lines. As you increase the relative density or as the relative density increases, the friction angle uh, increases. 
So this means for denser uh, soils, denser granular soils, the friction angle is larger. So that's to be expected. And then if you look uh, the trend in the horizontal axis, as you increase the dry unit weight, uh, as the dry unit weight increases, uh, you observe the friction angle phi prime also increases. So that's just to give you an idea of a uh, typical range of um, uh, some, some granular soils. Direct shear tests can be performed on both dry soil specimen and fully saturated soil specimen. So for drained direct shear test, if you're testing a saturated sand specimen under an ordinary loading rate, because for sand, the hydraulic conductivity K is relatively high, so the excess power pressure generated during normal loading and shearing process can be dissipated relatively quickly. The friction angle you get from direct shear tests conducted on saturated sand phi prime will be the same as that of a dry sand. This is, however, a very different story for saturated clay. Uh, for clay, we know the hydraulic conductivity is relatively low, so K is very small. So it can take very long time for excess pore water pressure to dissipate in clay. So when you shear or uh, when you shear a saturated clay sample in a direct shear test, so the shearing rate must be sufficiently slow, must be sufficiently small to allow full dissipation of excess pore water pressure. And also for because clay is cohesive material, for normally consolidated clays, the cohesion the effective stress-based cohesion C prime is approximately zero for normally consolidated clays. But if the clay is overly consolidated, if for over consolidated clay, the cohesion C prime is not zero. Uh, this picture here, this figure shows the uh, drain the direct shear test conducted on saturated clays. Um, for normally consolidated clay, uh, this line fifty to these triangle data points. So that's shear stress at failure, that's tau f versus the effective normal stress uh, figure. So for normally consolidated clay, you notice the intersection is at the origin, meaning the C prime value is approximately zero. So C prime, so the more coolant failure envelope tau f is simply normal stress on the failure plane times tangent of effective stress friction angle phi prime. For over consolidated clay, so this is OC clay, and this is NC. For OC clay, the intersection with the y-axis is not zero. That's your C prime value. So the shear strength or the shear stress at failure tau f is C prime plus sigma prime tangent phi prime. So that's OC clay. So you have both C prime and phi prime for OC clay. The figure at, on the right, this is a typical shear stress versus um, shear displacement behavior. And you will notice, and this is performed on OC clay. And you will notice that the behavior is similar to thin sand in the sense that the material reaches a peak shear strength value when you're initially shearing the specimen. And then the shear stress decreases as you increase the shear displacement until it reaches the residual shear strength. So again, this is a similar type of behavior as the uh, uh, dense sand. Uh, there are some general comments I want to make on direct shear test. Uh, first, a direct shear test uh, is perhaps the simplest and most economic test for dry or saturated sandy soil. So you can perform this test relatively quickly and it's very easy to set up. Uh, there are some drawbacks of uh, direct shear test. First, um, in the direct shear test, so remember you are split the soil specimen in half and you're moving, you're shearing one half of the soil, soil specimen with respect to the other. So basically you're force, forcing the soil specimen to fail along the horizontal plane. So this horizontal plane, this failure plane, uh, 
may not necessarily be the weakest plane in the soil. So typically in soil, the failure tends to happen along weakest plane. But for direct shear test specimen, because you're forcing the soil specimen to fail along horizontal, so you're not actually obtaining failure along the weakest plane. And the second drawback is the shear stress along that failure plane uh, is not uniform. So when you calculate the shear stress, you're assuming it's uniform, so you can use um, shear force as divided by the cross-sectional area A. So this is based on the assumption that the shear stress is uniform, but in reality, there's a very high boundary effect along that failure plane. And um, there, one of the key advantages of direct shear test actually is it can be used to determine interface friction uh, properties. And this can be very useful when you want to find out, say, the interface friction between soil, so this is a soil, and the foundation material. So this is your foundation. And the way to do that is actually uh, very similar to um, to test uh, a normal soil specimen. Um, so if you look at this setup here, you can put your foundation material uh, in, let's say, at the bottom half of this shear box, and then put soil specimen for soil uh, at the second, at top half of this shear box, and then you just perform your direct shear test as you would for regular soil specimen. And you can calculate the shear stress at failure and plot it versus the uh, effective uh, normal stress. And then you can obtain uh, this more coolant failure criterion function, tau f. So where in this equation, so again, sigma prime, this is a normal stress on that horizontal failure plane. And C prime A, that's adhesion, similar to the cohesion in the more coolant failure criterion. And delta prime here, that's your effective angle of friction between soil and foundation element.